give us a quick little sermon this morning. Somebody is sitting there saying, but wait a minute, she's only got to do it once. Why is it going to be quick? It's just what we say. We always tell you, it's going to be a quick little sermon. And then we proceed to preach for about 25, 45 minutes. Anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Somebody's scared now going, wait a minute, we didn't say we wanted all of that. We just wanted her not to rush so much. It's going to be all right. Amen? It is going to be all right. <clears throat> My topic this morning, I changed it a little bit, so let me say what I said it was going to be. This little light of mine. And I know as Gigi read the scripture, someone looked at the topic and said, well, how's she going to pull that out? I don't know, but let's see what happens, eh, right? All right, let us pray. Good and gracious God, we just thank you for this opportunity, for this time to sit in your presence and feast at your feet. Lord God, I ask that you would sit me down and that you would stand up within me so that the people of God could truly be blessed and hear what thus saith the Lord. Lord God, we realize it is your word. It is your word that must live within us that must rule over us, that must have reign within us, so that we truly can have a positive, impactful effect on this world that we're living in. Lord God, we say just sit, just let us sit down and learn from what it is that you would have for us to know. And let the church say amen Amen. and amen. Psalm 139 verses 1 through 6. It's It's a relatively familiar Uh, portion of scripture, I would say. Um, It's not necessarily one that people um, memorize, but people are kind of familiar with it when they hear it. Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before the word is on my tongue, oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I I cannot attain it. If you spend any time in scripture, we know that these words were penned by David. And David was quite excited and elated about this tidbit of information that he had found out. For some, we are made a little uncomfortable when we find that there are people who truly know us. We we find ourselves a a little put off when we realize that there are folks out there who who know the inward parts, who who know the, the unclean parts, who know the parts that aren't really churchy, you know where I'm going. See, we, we, we've got this dichotomy that exists within us, and as, as much as we want to, to live and be our authentic selves and be exactly who we are, we have been called by Christ to live to a different standard. And at times, there's, there's this, this reckoning that goes on within each and every one of us because we want to be this way, and so that is what we put out in the world. And yet, there's the other side that which happens at home. Now, now don't feel bad. I'm not going to ask anybody to give up and stand up and give me an account of who you really are. We're not going to put ourselves through that this morning. But isn't it good to know that there was at least one person throughout the course of history who said, I'm glad to know that the Lord truly knows me inside and out. I remember when I first started preaching, I mean, for real, for real, when I first started preaching, it used to concern me because I was like, but I I just want to be me. I just want to be able to be who I am. I just want to be comfortable with where I'm going. I just want to be Terry all the time. I just want to, you know, just be me. And what I learned is that you can't necessarily just be you. You have to allow yourself to be, to be molded, to be changed, to, to grow in such a manner that you inspire others. And so I couldn't just continue to just stay ragged like I was, talking about, well, I'm going to preach a mighty good word and then want to cuss you when I got outside. I'm saying sometimes 
We don't want folk to know the real inside parts of us. But David was not like us. And because he was not like us, it allows us to be able to really understand what was going on. See, see, David looked at it and he was just like, wow, imagine how great and wondrous God must be in order to have all of that knowledge, all of that understanding about each and every person how powerful that knowledge is. You ever had anybody know something on you and then felt like they had some power over you and just felt like that they could then treat you any old kind of way or get you to do anything they wanted you to do because they were going to tell your business? David realized that the God that we serve wasn't going to try to blackmail any of us, wasn't going to try to get us to act in a different way, but was simply aware of who we were. And that pleased him because he realized, you know what? God's not trying to do anything against me. God's not going to try to hold this over my head. God simply sees me as I am. And I had to grow and learn that it's okay for people to just see you as you are. And for them to understand you are work in progress. Now, that doesn't give any one of us carte blanche to not change, to not challenge ourselves, to not grow. That just simply means that it gives us the ability to see each and every one of us as people and realize that sometimes we fall short. Sometimes we mess up. Sometimes we say the wrong thing. And quiet as is kept, I'm going to whisper it so I don't hurt nobody's feelings. Sometimes we think the wrong thing. Shh. Nobody in here, though. That's for those other folk who've been playing church, but not us, because we, we really mean this thing, right? Yes, yes, we do. Yes, we do. But, but let's, let's just run on, because y'all are like, yeah, but, but where's she going with it? I'm going to get there. Y'all know I got I to gotta get going, but I, I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. So when I started looking at this, I want to just break down these six verses for you, if I could. It won't take all day. It won't be real long. It's only four pages. It's only four pages. I I didn't come in with an eight-page sermon talking about how am I going to finish. It's only four. Now, I had a couple of people say to me, take as long as you need to, Pastor. Everybody's going to be here. Don't rush. We're willing. We want to hear everything. And I said, praise God, that is so kind and sweet of you to say that, but I promise you that's not what I did. Because everybody doesn't necessarily feel like, well, I want to know how long can she really preach? Everybody doesn't want to know, Carol. Everybody doesn't want to know. But if you ever want to, let me know. I promise you I can do it. I promise you. Y'all don't want to know. Y'all be like, what? She can preach that long? Yes, she can. But it's all right. It's all right. And so when you're looking at these verses, what we can tell immediately is how well God knows each and every one of us. When we look at it, we find out that, that David talks about the Lord has searched him and known him. Searched him as though he needed to dig down into the deep crevices of who David was to truly find out at the crust, at the core of his person, who is David. And that part just baffled me because I was like, God created David. God created everything. So God really didn't have to search him out. God really didn't have to dig down too deep to know who David was because God had created all that David was. And yet, David felt like God knows me so well that God must have spent some time just sitting there pondering my life, looking back over all that I have done, all the places I've gone, the things I've said, such that God knows me better than anyone else. I thought that was so amazing that he was able to look at this God who created everything and decide that this God had spent this type of time just on him with the understanding that God would have had to do that with each and every person that's been made. That's an all-powerful, omniscient type of thing when you can think of a God that knows you to such an extent you feel like 
all of that time, energy, and effort has been put in to just simply understanding who it is that you are. And I just looked at that and I was like, how interesting that someone would sit and think about that. Because I still at times get uncomfortable when somebody feels like they know me. Because I want to know, well, what is it that you think you know? Well, well what part of me do, do you think that you know? I struggle with knowing me at times. It's, it's something I deal with day to day, trying to find out who I am. You know, used to walk around trying to read all of the books in Oprah's book club so that I could know who I was, trying to be my authentic self and find out exactly who am I? What is my personality like? Who is it that I really want to be? How do I want to walk in this world? How is it that I want to hold my head up? What do I want people to think and feel and say about me when I'm not in their presence? And trying to determine that I'm like this man felt like he was excited that God knew him how can that be when many of us don't want to even know ourselves we don't want to sit down and have those deep conversations with ourselves we don't want to sit down and do the journaling to find out what's really going on inside of each one of us we don't really want to sit there and contemplate some of our actions and activities Okay, I'm going to keep moving. I'm going to keep moving. This might be a bit heavy for a Sunday morning. But just know that David was excited that the Lord knew him and was not negatively impacted by this information in any way. He just simply thought, it's the greatest thing going. God knows me. And I said, wow. If only I could have come to that knowledge, that realization earlier in life, I too probably could have had a little more joy than I had in my, my 20s and my 30s and my 40s. Y'all know what it's like. You know what it's like when you, str come on somebody, you got to know what it's like when you're trying to, trying to get there. It takes a while. We act like we come into ourselves at 18 and we got it figured out and know what's going on. And that's when we really realize I don't know nothing. And by the time you get to your 20s, you're like, oh, my goodness, what's going on? And then you get to your 30s and you go, how did I even make it this far? And you get to your 40s and go, wait a minute, I need to reassess and try something different. Has anybody ever been there when they said, I, I don't even know myself, but I, I got to try to figure this thing out so we can make some changes? Anybody? Any, anybody? Any, yeah, it's hard to know who you are, and yet David was excited about a God who knew him. If only we could, we could be that excited. But he goes on to tell us how God is able to, to demonstrate this knowledge, gives us an exhaustive list of what it is that God knows about us. And he lets us know that God knows us when we sit down and stand up, when we go to sleep and when we wake up. He, he did this duality of opposites so that we would understand that it's not just a little bit of knowledge, but it's from this far on this side all the way this far on the other side, that there was no portion in between in the midst of any portion of our character, our anatomy, our thought process, our, our cognitive abilities, our, 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 our mannerisms and our speech. There's no part that God simply doesn't know. That there's nothing that we do that escapes God's eye. And although at times it's comforting to know that God is right with us, and that God is right there helping us. There are times when I want God to not notice everything that I do. You know, sometimes, if we're really honest, we would like to just kind of set it down for a moment if we could. And just simply be. But David tells us, even if we try to set it down, God simply already knows what's going to happen and then goes on a little further to 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 remind us if you will that even if we don't set it down that God already knows our thoughts even if we contemplated what we were going to say what we were going to do where we were going to show up that God is aware of it 
even if it's just for a brief moment, when you wake up and go, I'm not going to that church today. Anybody, 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 anybody ever wake up? I mean, I, I ain't not today. I'm tired. I'm, let me try to roll back over. Come on. I know they get sometime. You ever woke up on Monday morning and was like, I'm not, I ain't worried about that job. Them people can go ahead somewhere. I don't feel like putting up with it today. I mean, of course, we all get up, get dressed, and, and keep going to the job. We, I know I do. Now, don't feel bad. I ain't thought that not at all since I've been pastor, and I've been loving that every minute. But you catch me the mother 20-some years of my career. Whoo! I wanted to tell the school system where to go, how to get there, and that I would take them quickly. Because sometimes, Brother Bruce, sometimes, there you go. But even those thoughts, although we didn't act on them, just the mere fact that they ran through our minds, God was aware of them. And it even tells us that <clears throat> the words that were on our tongue, that we contemplated saying, you know that time you saw that person and what came out was, oh, praise the Lord, it's so good to see you today. But that it was something else going through your filter. Anybody? Always have a filter. Your pastor always has a filter. Always has a filter. And I'm grateful to know that even though the words sit ready at the time to just come and unleash themselves, that God is going, I know that you struggle with trying to tell folk about themselves and get them told. I do. I mean, I do. I ain't going to lie to you. I do. But God still says, I'm going to teach her how to hold the tongue so that she don't just be cutting up folk left and right. And I'm not going to penalize her because she's not perfect. But I'm going to keep working with her so she don't just keep cutting up folk left and right. Aren't you grateful for that, Mom? She's like, yes, because there have been days I wanted to just snatch them lips off my face. I'm sure that there have been. But even still, she's been gracious enough to say, well, that's still my baby. I love it anyhow. And yes, God is working with her. Right, Mom? Yeah, she, she, yeah, she in the back shaking her head deep because she knows that inner person. And yet David, he was excited about this information. And he even goes on to says. <clears throat> Even though you know what I'm thinking, even though you know what I want to say, even though you know how I want to act and where I want to go, you still hem me in, in front of me, behind me, underneath, and over top, so that everything comes out and happens just the way it's supposed to. We don't have to wonder. We don't have to despair on if God really is there because we know that God has hemmed us in. Now, at times, we look at that hemming in and feel like if God would just loose me, then I could go ahead and do this thing. But it is God actually saving us from ourselves, keeping us from doing those things that will cause problems. Caring for us enough to say, I'm not gonna let you go down that road. Realizing that when we take that statement and say it, we can't get the impact back. Those people will never unhear those words and things will never be the same again. God simply hems us in for our own protection, even when we try to fight it. Anybody ever try to fight it? That's all right. That's all right. You don't have to tell me. You're sitting there and somebody's saying, mm -hmm, I'm trying to fight it right now. But that's all right. That is all right. That is all right. Because it helps us to understand exactly what the scripture wants us to know. Because with all of that, David looks at it and thinks about it and contemplates it and says, Phew. just knowing that the Lord knows all of that and does all of that. That's just too good for me to know about. I can hardly contain myself over the joy that it brings to know that the Lord still has my best interest heart 
after realizing and knowing all of those things. I imagine David sat and said, you know, God is so good, I, I just don't know how not to be excited about it. And so David penned those words. And as I read over them trying to prepare for today, I realized that that's something that we have to find a way to reconcile ourselves with so that we can walk in that good information as well. It should be something that excites us as well as opposed to making us leery. And then as I contemplated the fact that it was Halloween and thought about what I was supposed to preach about, anybody ever sat in churches where every Halloween they give you the sermon on how it's not really a Christian thing and we really shouldn't do it and you just, it's pagan and you, you just get beat down and you think, I just wanted to give the kids some candy. I, I, I just wanted the kids to have a good day. I, I, I wasn't trying to do nothing to nobody. I, I just wanted a snicker. Any, any, <laughs> you know, and, and I thought about that, and I was like, well, I ain't got no problem with Halloween, Lord. I, I just want the kids to have some candy. And anybody who was outside with me yesterday saw, yeah, she was willing to get them kids some candy. As I picked that bucket up and poured it into one child's bag, and the parent was like, wait, I got to take them home. I said, you do, but that can go in the freezer. They can have some next week. And then he was like, well, yeah, can I get a couple of them Reese cups? <laughs> because people just want a little bit of a goodness in life. They just want a, a little bit of a good time in life. It doesn't have to always be something that's just so, so stoic and rigid that you can't have any goodness with it. And it reminded me, when I was younger one time, I was in elementary school, we had gone on a trip to a pumpkin patch. And when I came home, I had this little pumpkin. It wasn't real big, it was one of them, you know. And I, I walked in and I was so excited about the pumpkin, I put it on the kitchen table. And I remember my sister looking at this pumpkin going, and what are we supposed to do with that? <laughs> my sister is six and a half years older, so anytime I came home excited, she was willing to let me know, mm -mm, that ain't nothing to be excited about. And so I was like, it's a pumpkin. I've been to the pumpkin patch. Mom, you remember when we went to the pumpkin patch? Oh, Lord. Did y'all did hear that deep sigh? Yeah, I remember. <laughs> yeah, but we went, and I was so excited, and we got the pumpkin, and she came home, and she wiped it off because pumpkins are dirty. They've been outside in the ground. Anybody? I was shocked. I was appalled by the whole thing. But she came home, and she wiped it off, and got a knife and she started cutting down in it to try to cut the top off of it and it was kind of hard because they kind of thick and so she finally got it off and and she looked inside of it and she said mm, we're gonna have to clean all of this out so she spread out the newspaper and I dumped it, all the stuff out on the kitchen table and I was cleaning it out and she was standing there slightly repulsed and my sister went on upstairs like I don't know what's wrong with y'all but I was excited because I was cleaning out this pumpkin and I was like what are we gonna do with it and she was just kind of looking at me like my god why is my child so young why is she so excited about this pumpkin but we went on and we cleaned it up and cleaned it all out and she got the stuff off my hands, you know. It's kind of hard getting all of that whatnot off of your hands. But it reminded me of David with the Lord knowing the inside parts and that sometimes they had to be cleaned out. It had to be removed such that you could get to the good part and that he was excited about that cleaning process of God knowing the inward parts of who he was, of God realizing that, you know what? God saw what was filled inside of me and was willing to take all of it out and still work with me. And so as we cleaned out the inside of that pumpkin and, you know, she put some of them seeds on the, the cookie tray and, and she was going to put them in the oven and, and I don't know what became of them, but I, I don't think it turned out well. But, but we went on ahead and got the magic marker and, you know, put on the eyes and the nose and drew the little smiley face. I think our hand was tied. We didn't do no more cutting. But, but she drew the smiley face on the pumpkin and put the top on it. And I was like, that's nice. That's pretty. But the ones in the store, everybody know about those words, but the ones in the store. The ones in the store, you can see inside of it when the top is on it. 
And so she, now my, mom had been at work all day, but she picked up the knife and so she commenced to trying to cut out the mouse so we could see inside of it. And this, I remember she called my sister down, Tony, come on and work on this pumpkin. I'm, I'm tired. And so she had gone upstairs to change out of her work clothes. I always excited my mom when she came home from work with whatever it is I was going on. And so she would always be in her work clothes, her good work clothes, not to play clothes. She was in her good work clothes and I'm standing there with this pumpkin. So she's standing there, got her good work clothes on trying to clean this out. And after a while, I guess she said, this girl has lost her mind. So she went on upstairs so that she could change and, and be a little more comfortable. And my sister had to finish cutting out the mouth. And you know, it's, it's, pumpkins look easy. They look easy. Anybody ever cut a pumpkin? They are not real easy. And so she went and she cut a little bit more and we eventually got the mouth open. And I was like, well, what about the eyes and the nose? Because I was little, I knew I wasn't going to have a knife, but I wanted the, the enjoyment of seeing the process. And after a while, my mother was like, no, I think just a good smile is enough. She, she, she caught me with that, a good smile. Mom, I'm, I'm aware now that you took advantage. I'm aware now. But, but we had that good smile. And I was like, but the, but the ones in the store, but the, but the ones in the store, they, they got a candle. They got the light on the inside of them. Well, mom went looking for a tea light candle such that she could stick on the inside. And we eventually found the candle, it wasn't tea light, but it was about yay long and she kind of scraped along on the inside of it and got it down in there. And then she lit it. And I remember standing there just looking at it excited when I saw the, the little light flickering on the inside of my pumpkin. Cause by then it was a jack-o'-lantern. And we had done something marvelous in that house. She had made me a jack-o'-lantern. And I stood and I looked at it and I was so excited. And I thought about that as I put this sermon together. How God knows us so well that even after scraping out all the icky stuff, even out after removing all of the, the bad behaviors, even after making sure we don't say the wrong thing, even after making sure that our thoughts don't get held up in that one thought that's gonna mess us up, that God puts something on the inside of us such that we have a light that will shine outside of us. And that light allows us to be excited about the process that we just went through. And that's where I realized the joy that David had when David realized how well God knew him, how much God had invested in him, how pleased he was to know that even in my sitting down and in my standing up, even when I get ready to go to sleep and wake up, even when I get ready to eat and get up from the table, before I take my first step in the morning, before I go to bed at night, before I get in the car to go somewhere, before I meet, make my destination, whether I've said the right thing, thought the right thing, done the right thing, that in some way God has still hemmed me in and kept me from going as far off the rails as I would have probably done on my own. And I realized that the reason that David was excited about that is because he had that little light on the inside of him that God had put there and he was able to see how if he could let that light so shine and illuminate itself that it would get to the point that others would look and say, hey, I want that light inside of me. I, I want that thing that I see. Just a little flickering light. It's, it's not always big and bright. It's not always something that you can see from afar off. Sometimes you got to get up close because it'll be something small. And if you peer and look at it just so, just a little bit, I believe I see a light. And it is that light that flickered inside of David, which allowed him to be excited about the knowledge that the Lord knew him. Well, I came to tell you this morning that we too have that same light that is inside of each and every one of us, that same light that the Lord has put inside of us. And even after all, all of the parts have been cleaned out and God knows who we are and what we are, 
And quiet as it's kept, sometimes we don't even want to know who we are and what we are. But God still looks at each and every one of us and says, you know what? I'm going to make sure that little light shines. I'm going to make sure that that light that flickers will draw someone's attention. And so as I was outside yesterday and I looked at the people who decorated the cars, I'm I'm not going to lie to you, I I didn't decorate my car. I didn't even stand outside my own car. It was just parked on the parking lot. But I saw a couple of women who had some pumpkins that were hanging up, and it reminded me of the pumpkin that my mom carved for me when I was a little girl and how she found a way, even though it was difficult, even though she hadn't uh, cut up a pumpkin before, even though she couldn't find that small tea light candle, but she found a way to get a light on the inside. And it reminded me that God even has to find a way to get a light on the inside. Sometimes we're not open and receptive to it. Sometimes we want to turn our back on it. Sometimes we want to walk away from it. Sometimes we don't want to open up the Bible. Sometimes we don't want to get on our knee and pray. Sometimes we don't want to see what's going on in the world. Sometimes we don't want to give attention to the things and the atrocities that need to be changed. Sometimes we just want to keep on doing what we've always been doing because that's what's been most comfortable for us. But God still finds a way to get a little light on the inside. God still finds a way to make sure that it can begin to flicker. And although it's small at times, because we didn't even want to have it in the first place, God finds a way to make sure that that light never goes out. And the reason that light doesn't go out is because God put a little light on the inside that always is going to shine on the outside. And when it begins to shine, people start looking for it. People start seeing. And even in the darkness, when we feel like we don't have a light to shine, there's something inside of each and every one of us that others are able to see and so they'll walk up to you and go hey you got a light I see something inside of you I sense something coming from you you ever had somebody come up to you in the grocery store for no reason and just start talking to you about the Lord just start talking to you about what's going on in their life just start talking to you about what's happening in the world why do strangers feel compelled to just come talk to you because they see a little light that's on the inside they see something that's been moving inside of you and it identifies with something that's inside of them See, I'm one of those people who will be in the store and just start talking to a stranger for no reason. I was raised not to talk to strangers, but I'm a little bit older now, and so I'll go on and talk to them. And if it look like they might know who Jesus is, if it look like I can say amen and they'll be with me, if it look like they might have been a Christian somewhere down the road, I'm going to ask them, hey, do you have a light? Because what I'm looking for is somebody whose flicker is still flickering. I'm looking for someone whose light has not gone out. I'm looking for someone who can connect with the God that's inside of me. I want to connect with the God that's inside of them. And sometimes it's just so that I can have an enjoyable time while I'm standing in the line. Sometimes you just, you got five people in front of you. You need to be able to talk about something. And it goes something like this. My gosh, there's a whole lot of people in this store today. Yeah, it is. Mm. Well, praise God, I guess everybody's employed and has the opportunity and the ability to make a purchase. And they go, yes, isn't God been so good? And that's how you check to see if the light has been flickering. See, what happens in this world is we don't always check and see if the light has been flickering because we forget that we have a little light. But I came to tell you this morning that we all have a little light on the inside and it's got to just keep flickering. And the way we keep making sure that it works is we just have to keep checking with somebody else's light to the tune that we're just looking to go, this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. And while I'm letting my light shine, I'm looking for another flicker. 
I'm looking for another light. I'm looking for somebody who wants to sing it with me. I'm looking for somebody who wants to live it with me. I'm looking for somebody who wants to encourage me. I'm looking for somebody who wants to talk about how good God is. I'm looking to see if there's anybody else anywhere in the world who knows about this light that has been put inside of me and if they want to rejoice with me while I rejoice in the light that God has put inside of me. See, sometimes you got to look at the situation and you have to understand that what God really has done has made sure that each and every one of his children has the opportunity and the ability to share the word of God, not just with themselves, but with somebody else. It's not just me who talks to strangers to see if they have a light on the inside. All of us have got to find an opportunity now, somebody's saying, but it's COVID and I'm wearing a mask. Well, it's COVID and you're wearing a mask. But you're still supposed to let your little light shine. You're still supposed to engage somebody and see what's going on. You're still supposed to feed somebody and make sure they're all right. You're still supposed to check in with somebody and make sure that they have no need. You're still supposed to be praying for others. You're still supposed to be reading your word. You're still supposed to just always be at one in communion and fellowship with the saints and the body of Christ, even with your mask on. So as we continue to wear our masks for as long as the government deems it necessary, we got to continue to let our light shine as long as the Lord deems it necessary. So I encourage you this morning to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that there is a light inside of you that flickers and it simply cannot be extinguished, but that we ought to rejoice in the fact that is there and proceed to keep looking for somebody else's light. And before we know it, we'll all be standing there singing this little light of mine and I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Amen.